or that's part of our phase resumption of question times, that only listed questions uh, will be asked of ministers. Topical questions remain suspended until the 4th of July. The member asking the listed question will have an opportunity to ask the supplementary question. And I will keep progress under review uh, during question time. And it, it, should it become apparent that time will be available uh, near the latter end, uh, part of questioning, I may ask others to uh, place supplementary questions. We will begin with questions to the Minister for Communities. And I call Andrew Muir. Mr Muir. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question number one, Minister. Kolyan, thank the member for his questions. Very, very good question. Uh, during the current crisis, the advice sector has been critical in assisting the most vulnerable people in our society. Advice organisations across our community continue to deliver frontline support, and I want to acknowledge this work and personally thank them for what they have delivered on the ground every day as we now move into a period where constriction or restrictions are being eased. I am committed to protecting those in most need across our society, and access to community-based independent advice services is critical to meeting that commitment. My officials have worked closely with regional and local frontline advice organisations on a co-designed production approach to develop support mechanisms. Transition planning is now well underway to assist both regional and grassroots organisations to return to normal business while still ensuring that those citizens affected by COVID-19 continue to receive the much-needed support. The Community Helpline will continue to connect those most vulnerable people to local support services through our stakeholders in the voluntary and community sector, and I have allocated additional funding to support this. Uh, 1.8 million in additional funding for debt-related advice will provide much-needed support to these individuals and small businesses experiencing financial problems due to coronavirus. Uh, and my officials are currently exploring options to ensure this funding achieves maximum impact. My department continues to provide significant direct financial support of over 6.4 million per annum, supporting 360 jobs in the sector, delivering independent community-based advice, service, advice services to over 200 and 30,000 citizens. Thank you. I call Andrew Muir for supplementary. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her response. I also welcome the Minister to her role, and I pass on, on behalf of myself and my party, our best wishes to uh, Deidre Hargey for her speedy recovery uh, and, uh, and, uh, after her period of illness. Uh, as a supplementary, I thank obviously the Minister for her response, but what, what we are emerging from is a public health emergency going into an economic um, crisis and recession, and will the Minister meet up with the advice sector to further explore what support measures are required to ensure that they can assist people going through the economic downturn ahead? Um, well, certainly the short answer is yes, I absolutely will. I uh, continue that work that Dirty Harvey started, uh, and uh, indeed with the officials. Um, I've seen some of the social media commentary uh, around advice from the very start of this, and everyone possible. All partnerships have worked together and the advice sector has loomed large, but it is, it, it is important that we talk to the experts, learn lessons from the lived experience and try and adjust the services to go, go to those in, in need, but also those who are delivering those services. We need to listen to their experience in order to ensure it's effective, it's on the ground and people actually get a better outcome. So uh, happy to do the meeting with the advice sector, both independent structural, but certainly those in the grassroots who have been working throughout this crisis definitely need a hearing. Moving on, I call Alex Easton. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question number two. Thank the member for his question. Uh, my officials have had contact with Museums NI in relation to this matter. And museums have recently reviewed the relationship with the Model Engineer Society of Northern Ireland. The Model Engineer Society had enjoyed access to the wall garden within the Transport Museum for over 50 years in order to operate their model engines. Museums NI are currently developing a master plan for the Coltra site, which will more uh, better look at unlocking its potential to meet their long-term objectives. With these considerations in mind, Museums NI indicated to the Model Engineer Society in October 2019 that their continued use of the wall garden would not form part 
of the future plans for the site. However, Museums NI have not yet given the Society formal written notice to vacate. This is an operational matter for the management of Museums NI to ultimately decide upon. I call Alex Leeson for supplementary. Could I uh, thank the Minister for answers so far? Um, the Minister agreed with me that it's a shame that uh, the Model Engineering Society in Northern Ireland may have to leave the site. And would it not have been better to maybe look at different areas of the site where there's large spaces where they could be moved to? And at this late stage, would the Minister maybe consider writing to the, the Transport Museum and asking them would they look at other areas of the site for them to move to? Certainly the member will appreciate I'm just coming in, in, into this, um, so I will. I'm happy to write to museums, I'm happy to get a, a better update and a better briefing and certainly for the officials to communicate with the society to ensure that if there is potential that between my officials, museums, officials and the society can try and work something out because you know, they have been there for 50 years but I can't make any commitment and I'm not even going to Try to. The best I can do is try and get them together to see what can come out of it, and I'll keep the member informed. Thank you. I call Jerry Kelly. Question for you. Uh, question. Thank the member for his question. Um, the social supermarket pilot programme has been running since October 2017, with five sites in operation, and by the end of March this year, almost 120,000 people received support through the programme dealing with 148 uh, tonnes of food, which has been redistributed. The model uh, provides more of a significant experience than a food bank in terms of, in addition to that, it also provides people with a pathway out of poverty by supplementing food with access to wraparound services, including debt advice, budget and healthy eating, uh, training skills and other opportunities. The, a rolling evaluation of the pilot programme was completed uh, up until March of this year, and it did indicate that the support is reaching those who are particularly vulnerable with low income, debt, obligations, and high levels of unemployment. Um, the most common household profile has been that of lone parents. The, the evaluation also indicated that the programme is achieving significant outcomes for its users with really good positive impacts on their well being, their healthy eating, f food stability. Um, Additionally, the programme has provided a platform for collaboration. All five social supermarkets have connected with wider support net networks to leverage their involvement. This includes departments Make the Call initiative, which ensures individuals are getting access to all their benefits and supports that they may be entitled to. And the member may be aware that my predecessor, Deirdre Hargey, has decided to extend the pilot while a business case is undertaken to assess the case for rolling out a further programme. Thank you. I call Jerry Kelly for supplementary. Uh, I think the Minister has uh, sorted out my second uh, uh, plan. I mean, it was a very wide ranging, and, and the outcomes that she described were very heartening. Um, and it's unfortunate it was COVID 19, took COVID 19 to see how these, uh, these projects worked. So I think she has answered in the fact that the pilot is being um, moved forward. And I hope that. Uh, that the assessment goes back from that fairly quickly and moves on. So rather than a question, I think it's a comment. Fair enough, and appreciate that. Um, I think a lot of people will be asking for similar types of the social supermarkets in their own constituencies. In fact, most of us know of food banks and community and church groups and sport groups who have been absolutely instrumental throughout this crisis. Um, but what we all have learned, I think, from this is that we all need to pull together and work together. So. Providing food security for people is really important, but also providing advice and guidance that will help them look at areas like debt management, mental health, employability. So um, SIB did the review, did the evaluation. That's currently been disseminated with a view of taking forward uh, more social supermarkets and a lot more constituencies. Thank you. Moving on, I call Declan McAleer. Very much. Good luck, call you. Cash over a tree. Question three. Question four. <laughs> Just keep me on your toes, Jacqueline. <laughs> so, despite the current COVID pandemic, councils continue to play a key role in delivering essential services such as waste collection and disposal, community support, and the provision of registration and cemetery services. Also, 
All members will be aware of the severe financial challenges that each of the councils are facing presently. The funding of uh, 20.3 million from DFC will help to assist councils with their cash flow and support them in the delivery of vital services that they are providing the community at this time, but it will also help to ensure that they are ready to play their role in our post-pandemic recovery and limit the financial impact on repairs going forward. I also recognise that councils have a unique community insight to reach grassroots groups um, and are really well placed to ensure that citizens receive as much help as possible. DFC has provided 1.5 million of additional community support funding, and this money is an initial tranche, and more will follow. This is to provide assistance to those at risk due to financial stress, ensure an access to food for those in most need, and help connect those living alone or living in rural areas um, who are likely experience greater challenges. And people from all walks of life, as I said previously, have stepped forward to help citizens, neighbours, help with deliveries of food and medicines so they can remain safely in their homes. I call Declan McAleer for supplementary. Uh, I'm going to thank the Minister for answer to question four. Um, uh, will, the minister, um, will the best practice and the lessons learned from this uh, pandemic, will they be carried forward in terms of uh, future dealings with local government? I think they have to be. Uh, I, I know it's probably a well-worn phrase, but this, the COVID-19 presented us all with challenges, and we were literally just trying to deal with those as best as possible. Local government in the past has always kind of stepped forward in emergencies, but the global pandemic, I think, you know, I can't speak for your own constituency, but can certainly speak for Belfast. And without Belfast City Council, and indeed, I know even from our communities, our, uh, our support and appreciation for the work of local government has been well recorded, so I want to take that opportunity on behalf of us all to do that. But we must learn lessons. We must work out what we didn't do so well, but would like to. We must work out what we did well and would like to do more of. And I've absolutely no doubt there will be a financial cost of that too. But lessons learnt must be part of our post-COVID recovery. Moving on, I call Sinead Ennis. Deputy Speaker, question five. I thank the member for her question and I am pleased to advise that my department has moved quickly in response to the COVID-19 pandemic to relieve hardship and ensure the people in most need get the help and support they need. This has included introducing measures to ensure that the social security system is more flexible and to reassure very vulnerable people about the, the continuity of their benefits. In total, 16 sets of emergency regulations have been made in response to COVID-19. The immediate impact of these changes include to increase the amount payable under universal credit so that the average uh, award will go up by approximately £90 a month. Regulations to ensure that grants to self-employed people are appropriately treated uh, in their universal credit award and temporary changes to statutory sick pay rules to ensure, ensure support is available um, from day one for individuals who are sick, self-isolating or shielding. Uh, changes to the local housing allowance rates uh, which benefit private rented sector tenants also, and people in receipt of CARES allowance will continue to be paid the benefit that they have temporarily ceased to care for people uh, or they've been, self, or they've been uh, affected by COVID themselves. Changes to maternity allowance and statutory maternity pay, uh, as well as uh, the coronavirus job retention scheme. So the, the specific discretionary support scheme has been enhanced by introducing the level, Living Expenses Grant to help those find them, who find themselves in a financial crisis due to the, the impact of COVID, and an increase in the, the discretionary support annual allowance income threshold to £20,405 will also ensure that more people on low incomes can access emergency financial support. I call Sinead Ennis for supplementary. Good, and I thank the Minister for her response. Um, and I'd just like to ask the Minister if she considering um, continuing any of these mitiga mitigating uh, factors once the crisis has passed? Well, certainly the, a lot of these would have been um, direct borne consequentials from DWP and certainly the executive. And I think everybody has you know, recognised this. But the executive has also found additional money and DFC have spent it very, very well. Uh, the mitigation mitigation packages that are already there will certainly continue and I think collectively you know we need as an executive we need to look at what additional supports we can give people who are really vulnerable particularly financially on benefits and what that looks like so we're still working our way through this 
but certainly looking at any potential that we have uh, that isn't going to have a massive impact on the budget that's going to help people who really need it most. And I call Karen Mullen. Margaret, last can call her question number six. I thank the member for a question, um, and I am committed to delivering long-term sustainable solutions to poverty in all its forms, including food poverty. And there is no doubt the pre-existing inequalities have been exacerbated during this pandemic, and the increased need for food support is evidence of this. The extent of food poverty within our society has been underlined through the Access to Food programme, and one of the key elements of our emergency response during the current crisis was more than 150,000 food boxes have been delivered to those in most need. Since my department launched its COVID-19 food parcel service in April, and alongside this, allocations of 1.5 million financial support to councils also enabled a significant community response, with the majority of the interventions relating to food. This is also borne out by the increase in the use of food banks, with the Trussell Trust reporting a 142% increase in the demand for their services here. So, given these issues, my predecessor, Dear D. Hargey, agreed a package of medium term terms measures to support people experiencing food poverty, including the introduction of some grant flexibility, which would allow grant funded organisations to respond to the coronavirus, and, th and £3.3 million of funding for food related projects delivered under the Neighbourhood Renewal People in Place strategy. I call Karen Mullen for supplementary. I thank the Minister for her answer, and I would also like to thank Minister Hargey and yourself for your sterling work and the numerous interventions over the past number of months, and in particular the measures that protected and supported the most vulnerable in our communities. Many of these interventions, while very welcome, in particular, as you say, Minister, have shown a light on many areas of poverty and the need across the society. I'd like to ask the Minister, has she engaged with all our ministers to develop a cross-departmental approach to address food poverty? I thank the member for her question. And certainly, I know this is an issue quite close to her heart in terms of holiday hunger. And just this morning, Minister Peter Weir and I had a discussion about the announcement that was made last week, but certainly about what we would do, given the fact that the school term ends on Tuesday. The 30th of June. So it was a very good meeting, very productive meeting, um, and we're certainly committed to trying and getting food poverty addressed uh, through holiday hunger. And the member will also be aware, because even through your role in education, that on a long term basis, short, medium, and long term basis, we need to bring forward an anti poverty strategy that not just looks at holiday hunger in a COVID period, but certainly tries to address it in the long term, because it's all very well, but the phrase heat or eat is an experience for many people, and we need to try our best to put our best foot forward to get this sorted once and for all. But certainly, in this interim, we are looking at getting those uh, free school meal supplements into families. Thank you. And I call Orlea Flynn. I'll get a last can call you a question number seven at home. Thank the member for a question, uh, and housing in particular. The role and regulation of the private rented sector is one of the department's priorities and certainly one of my personal priorities. The department's consultation exercise on proposals for change to the role and regulation of the private rented sector ended on the 3rd of April 2017. So my department is currently carrying out a comprehensive review, review of the role and regulation of the private rented sector to improve standards for the benefits of both tenants and landlords. These areas that are included in the review include supply, they include affordability, security of tenure, tenancy management, property standards, and dispute resolution. And Minister Hargey had considered or was considering how to take forward the recommendations in that review and what other measures may be necessary, including proposals that may warrant future legislation. Since the outbreak, Minister Hargey put in place legislation to ensure private tenants are protected from eviction during COVID emergency, and this requires landlords to give a minimum of 12 weeks' notice to quit to their tenants. It is vitally important at this time those who live in private rent accommodation won't be forced out of their homes. My department has ensured or has issued detailed guidance to landlords and tenants, and I would also commend the services of housing rights, which the department funds to protect provide expert housing advice and mediation and guidance. Thank you. I call Orlea Flynn for supplementary. 
I'm not, thank you for your answer, Minister. I'm not sure if um, the, the review that you had spoke about there, if the um, current health and safety regulations are included within that, or if the Minister can commit to carrying out um, a separate review into, into those regulations within the private rented sector. Um, I'm not, the, the, the honest answer is I'm not sure, but certainly I know that when you look at security of tenure and you're looking at standards, standards for me would probably be the key word in that. So we do need to look at things like, you know, when the electricity was last checked, you know, is there mould or damp or the conditions that we're living in? Like, like given, I think it's more than half of the population of the private rented sector receiving housing benefit, that's public funds. Um, and unfortunately, there's a better standard of homes in public housing rather than private housing. But it's not to say, you know, private housing is bad. It's just that we have an obligation to ensure that tenants are living in a safe and clean and you know proper environment. So I'll certainly have a look to see what that uh, review covered, and I'll certainly write to the member and share it with the committee as well. Moving on, I call Keith Buchanan. Question yet, please. Thank the member for his question, um, and he's probably listened to some of the answers previously. So, if it does sound a bit repetitive, apologies. So, the access to the food programme, as the member will know, has proven to be one of the key elements of our emergency response during the current pandemic. And more than 150,000 food boxes have been delivered to those in most need uh, since my department launched its COVID-19 food parcel service in April of this year. And alongside this, allocations of 1.5 million pounds of financial support to councils have enabled a significant community response to those uh, in need of food, income and indeed connectedness. I am aware that there are a number of people across the community who are currently relying on regular food parcels from DFC and are likely to continue uh, to require their support uh, when, when the present uh, uh, crisis ends. As part of this transition from an emergency response, Deirdre Hargy decided to extend the food parcel beyond the 26th of June for people currently receiving a food box, but who have been shielded by their, D, their GPs and have no other access to food, and this support will be available for those who are medically shielded and in need of a food box until the end of July. For those not medically shielded, the Department recently made allocations of 1.5 million support to councils, and this enables them to make a significant contribution contribution to those uh, in need of food, income and uh, connectedness. And furthermore, DFC, as a member may be aware, has been delivering a social supermarket pilot programme um, as part of the welfare mitigations package. Call Keith Buchanan for supplementary. Thank you, and thank you, Minister, for your response. Just referring to your letter dated yesterday regarding that information you provided, which is the question was obviously timely, where you carried out an interim review. Can you con confirm to me who all was feeding into that review? Delivery partners, advice and AFA, etc., council? Because there seemed to be a different approach across some councils where some people getting some and some people getting not. And I appreciate it was put in, 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 in speed, the, 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 but it's, there's a different approach across the area. So what did that review entail? Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll, I'll have a look um, because I agree. I don't want, I don't think anybody wants a patchiness where one area gets a really good service, another area gets a half decent service, and another area is still trying to. I mean, that's regardless where your constituency is, regardless who the citizens are, they deserve the very best that we can provide them. So I'll try and find out and I'll write to the member. And if he even wants to share that correspondence with the officials up in the office, I'll try and get him a quick response. Thank you. And I call Colin McGrath. Deputy Speaker, question number nine. Thank the member for his question. The Department in Sport and I have provided both financial and practical support to the sector, including advice on access and COVID related relief programmes, maintaining the health and well being of members, and on putting together specific protocols for a safe return to sport. In terms of financial support, Sport and I immediately paid the sector grants to, that were due under existing programmes. The Department in Sport and I launched the Sports Hardship Fund, which now totals uh, 1.245 million, and this will enable 620 clubs to receive £2,000 grant to assist with the cost of maintaining their facilities. In addition to this, Minister Hargy made the case for clubs to be included in the eligibility criteria for the £25,000 hospitality, retail, leisure and tourist scheme. I can advise that I have submitted a bid uh, through the June monitoring to help 
prepare or prepare for further assistance uh, to the sports sector. And my officials are continuing to work with Sport NI on the Return to Sport framework, which provides vital guidance to the sports governing bodies as they develop their own protocols for a safe return to sport. I call Colin McGrath for supplementary. Uh, thank you very much indeed. And I welcome the reference from the Minister there to the um, June monitoring round to get additional funds because I'm sure, as many members are aware, within 48 hours of the scheme opening and had to close, and there will be hundreds of groups that weren't able to access that. Um, so I suppose maybe if I could ask if there are additional monies, would you commit to helping some of the governing uh, organisations which could help as well to be able to send funding out onto the ground? Well, I remember it well because I was on the Communities Committee, so we, we um, and particularly Johnny, remember the, um, the almost explosion of people who came, who literally had very little time to put their application in and then the whole thing was closed. Uh, governing bodies are key, they are key, um, and any sports is affiliated to a governing body, you know, even their ability to make sure that the advice, the guidance and the information is supported by Sport and I, so um, it makes sense that Sport and I would use the governing bodies to try and help disseminate that information, also to try and help give them support, so if they do apply, that they're in a good place to, to be, and to be honest with you, even just in relation to the previous questions, I think throughout this crisis, a lot of the sports clubs, local, not so much their governing bodies, but their sports clubs, because they're all citizens and residents, have been outstanding throughout this period. And uh, I, I do think that they have experienced great hardship, and despite that, they've rolled their sleeves up and they've got stuck in. Moving on, I call Michelle McLevine. Question number 10. Thank the member for her question, and I'd like to acknowledge the contribution that the hospitality sector makes to the economy and to our society more generally, and I'm keen to see that sector play its part in the safe recovery of COVID-19. The outdoor spaces close to hotels, bars and restaurants and cafes could be utilised to maximise the opportunity for these businesses to deliver their services, while ensuring the safety of both staff and customers. And I'd also like to emphasise that the needs of our citizens who are partially sighted or have disabilities or other mobility issues should be foremost in our minds when making any changes uh, to our streets. DFC owns a number of public spaces within towns and cities and sites which have been acquired for regeneration purposes, and we're willing to make these available where it can be helpful to support safe queuing, social distancing, or a spill-out space for those clubs uh, or so those cafes, bars and restaurants. I'm also grateful to my executive colleague, the Minister for Infrastructure, Nicola Mullen, because we have written to all councils asking them, as planned authorities, to temporarily take out or take a flexible and pragmatic approach to the use of street seating. I call Michelle McLevine for supplementary. Minister, for her response, and obviously welcome the progress that has been made um, since the, the question was submitted, particularly in relation to um, correspondence with, with the local councils. Could the Minister outline what plans her department has to help revitalise small towns such as like, sort of Newton Arts and Cumber within my own constituency um, as we move um, towards post COVID recovery? Well, I'm actually going to have a look at the portfolio of regeneration schemes, so a member will maybe appreciate as a former minister herself. I want to look at that because I'm aware that even in an area that you didn't mention, Bangor, there has been ongoing regeneration, but that's not to say that the rest of that consistency hasn't got bids or calls in. I think it's important that we use whatever time we have now to try and get, make sure that the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed, so when we could do go back to whatever the normal may look like, that we're not wasting time on things that we could have done in order to try and speed the process up. So I'll certainly have a look at um, what regeneration programmes there are. I know that even between my department and our colleague, uh, Evan Poutz, between the below 5,000 and above 5,000, there's a bit of work that we could do with that in terms of towns and villages and cities right down to small rural places. So I'll certainly have a look at it and write here. Uh, just to give her an update on what's happening in her own constituency. And I call Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question 11, please, Minister. Thank the member for her question. This is an important issue for my department and for me as well, and it was raised uh, on my behalf by the Housing Executive by the Permanent Secretary, and I will be discussing it with the Chair and the Chief Executive of the Housing Executive of a forthcoming accountability meeting. 
Prior to COVID-19 uh, and, and the subsequent lockdown, the Housing Executive took forward a pilot scheme with a view to streamlining a major adoptions process following the success of this pilot in the South region. And the Housing Executive mirrored this approach in the North region with time scales uh, for improvement in both cases. And in the past 12 months, prior to lockdown, the Housing Executive moved towards recruiting additional staff resources to undertake the design element of adoption in-house. This has proven to increase the quality and definitely improve the time frames. frames. And while good progress has been made, there are still backlogs following the insolvency of a consultant who previously provided much of this work along with other external factors. Uh, to mitigate this kind of ripple effect from a contractor insolvency in the future, the housing executive has gone to tender with the larger contract fr contractor framework and is hoping to attract a larger pool of contractors in order to limit the need to procure further uh, through the duration of any new contract framework. Kelly for supplementary. I thank the Minister for her answer. And the Minister will be well aware that the, any delays increase dependency on behalf of the applicant. But is, is the Minister uh, confident that there is sufficient funding to tackle the backlog so that whenever the systems are put in place and the consultants, etc., uh, engage, that we will be able to fast track, uh, especially given the importance of the construction industry as well as the applicant? Uh, to be honest, I can't say I'm confident yet because I haven't looked at all the details. But what I will, but, I, but can I assure the member that she should be confident that I'll certainly make this a priority, and, th and that's the only commitment I can give her. Uh, as well as the backlog that I've just outlined, she and other members will be aware there's been a backlog in OTs doing assessments, in order for those to be passed on to the housing either the housing executive or housing associations, for that report to be done for the adoptions. And meanwhile, you're talking about people, even for them to go from one place to another, for example, the kitchen or the bathroom, it's sheer agony. Their quality of life has reduced, so I'm with her. I want to make sure that we make this process as smooth and streamlined as possible, that we're not sitting in this situation again, and as well as looking at the whole contractor's arrangements, I'm also looking at the reports and the staff side representatives and the allied health professionals that are needed, because we need to unlock that. People are waiting too long, and to be honest, their lives are miserable, and I don't think any of us want that in our watch. Moving on, I call John Stewart. Question number 12, please. Thank the member for his question, and I want to thank all those involved in what has been a really great community effort. Uh, Minister Hargey responded quickly, and on the 20th of March, established an emergency response leadership group. This group, which includes local grassroots community groups as well as the wider voluntary community sector, has worked side by side with the department, with health, health and social care trusts and indeed with our local councils to ensure that tailored support is in place for the most vulnerable. The speed at which this cross-sectoral partnership approach was developed was particularly important and the COVID-19 Community Health Blame was launched on the 27th of March, only a few days after Shieldham was announced. I mentioned earlier, and the member was present, you know, access to food has been one of the most critical elements to the emergency response. Access to mediation is also particularly important for those shielding and support for those who are in shielding and in partnership with the Department of Health. We have helped over much, over 250 community pharmacies with voluntary and community groups who have delivered over 34,000 prescriptions. A further partnership has also seen the launch of a virtual wellbeing hub, providing mental health and wellbeing resources and support for those impacted by the crisis. And throughout this response, the department has ensured that financial assistance is accessible to those impacted by the pandemic and enhancement to discretionary support were quickly put in place. And over 99% of all universal credit claims have been paid in time each week, despite the caseload almost doubling. Call John Stewart for supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for your response. Um, can I um, congratulate you on your new position? Wish you well, and obviously, um, wish a speedy recovery to the former Minister Hargey. Um, do thank you for your response. I know this has been 
discussed um, somewhat already in terms of the food hampers and the packages, and I think we all take our hat off to that scheme to help those most in need. And also, one of the success stories and, and positive aspects to come out of this whole COVID crisis has been the community across the country uniting together to help the most vulnerable, and it's been amazing to see grid groups come together. I suppose, talking about the post-COVID debrief that we look at, if we ever have to roll a scheme like this out, could we maybe A, look at the quality of some of that food that was being put out? I know in the hamper scheme that we were on locally, we were seeing some of the stuff and it, out of date bread and things, maybe damaged goods. If we could look at that, it's never always going to be perfect. And also, some of the most vulnerable were being missed. So Can the member finalise his questions, please? Yes. Thank you. Um, so, that's not good enough, to be honest with you, because uh, we've all got our own dignity and nobody wants to get out of date bread. So, that's a message. You get that, you, you, you just feel like an afterthought, despite all the good efforts and the good heart behind it. So, I, I hear that. Uh, and also, what lessons? I think we need to learn the, the lessons. I think even access to like, some of the uh, supports under the social supermarket, they're looking at fresh fruit, fresh meat, fresh bread, uh, and we're all entitled to fresh food. So certainly lessons learned. And then again, um, for each council area, I think it's council who will be taking that forward in terms of not just of a win this second quarter of supports for money, and it isn't just about due diligence, it's also about everybody knows what they, do, they don't want to do again. But we do need to put down in paper a plan what we would need to do in the future to get us post-COVID and God forbid we ever go through a second wave of this, but that we're all in a better position than what we were in March. So thank you. Moving on, I call Philip McGuigan. Gary Melgan, uh, last time call your cash ever a three jig. I thank the member for his question. And during the crisis, volunteers have been critical to the success of the community level response. They've been involved in a, a wide range of activities to support vulnerable people, including providing practical support, delivering food, prescriptions, collecting shopping, uh, even right through to emotional support uh, and well-being support and sporting organisations. And indeed, some of the faith-based groups have stood out in terms of their their real contribution. And, the, and they've played a massive role, and indeed some of the business have as well, even within the role as a volunteer. Sporting organisations have played a key stakeholder, have been a key stakeholder throughout this crisis, and I want to commend everyone who has volunteered, particularly the grassroots organisations, who have supported volunteers in many ways, have been the first responders during this crisis. It is important to recognise the indi individual acts of kindness by so many people, for people checking on their neighbours, picking their messages up, chatting to each other over the fence, walking their dogs, whatever it's been. These strong communities and strong bonds have been crucial throughout this emergency, and we will continue to ensure that their significance and contribution is recognised as we all hopefully move into the recovery phase. Thank you. I call Philip McGuigan for supplementary. Uh, I want to echo uh, the Minister's uh, kind words and praise uh, for the, the support and contribution of the community and voluntary and sporting organisations during this. Uh, does the Minister believe that there are lessons that can be learnt from the, the mobilisation of volunteers across community volunteering and sporting sectors, and can it be built upon? The answer is yes. Uh, it definitely can be built upon. Like I know in North Belfast, Paul and I's consistency, we had soup deliveries from north to west Belfast, from the New Lodge to the Shankill, from right across. So even relationships that were there, always there, and you know, worked through the most difficult of times, they shone throughout this pandemic. You know, the Shankill made all the Sundays, the soup on Sunday for residents. You would have got another kitchen making the roast chicken and the roast beef. You got the youth clubs trying to put it together, deliver it all very, very safely. But they, they, they were all groups. You had GA soccer clubs. The scouts, different people out delivering them all. I mean, you wouldn't have got that amount of effort in absence of a crisis, despite the fact that they all do good work. So we can't lose sight of those connections and hopefully those friendships that will endure well beyond this crisis. Members, we're now coming to our final question, and I uh, would hope to be able to take a supplementary if anyone else wishes to rise in their place. I now call Rosemary Barton. Minister, question 14. Thank you. Uh, I thank the member for a question. And my department is seeking to target uh, and help those in most need. And again, I'm sure the member has listened. The food parcel service has been critical, particularly delivering to people who are vulnerable or 
have been shielded uh, through notification from their GP. These boxes have also been available to people who are not sh shielding and who are in critical need of food. Uh, people are able to request uh, support through the COVID-19 Community Helpline and a triage system is operated locally through helplines to, to assess the individual needs of the person if they're shielding or non-shielding or has already received support through other networks such as family and friends. Call Ruth McBarton for supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Thank you for your answer. Uh, Minister, the, with the food parcel service continuing, there were some people who did not get food parcels that were eligible. Will there be a guarantee that those people will be considered this, I use the word second time around, but you understand, starting from the beginning of uh, June onwards, that type of thing, or July onwards? Um, well, first of all, that we were told it was 40,000 people who were shielded in letters, and that actually doubled, more than doubled. Uh, I mean, I know even the my own constituency people only got their first shield in letter, never mind the continuation of it, four weeks ago. Uh, now, granted, they were helped out by neighbours, but without their neighbours' vigilance, they may have been ignored. So I understand what the member's saying, but I do think we need to... That's the sort of lesson that we need to look at. We need to build into the review to ensure that those people aren't missed a second time. The shielding, the food boxes are continuing until the 31st of July. And then after that, we just need to look at other opportunities for support. I call Paula Bradley. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for answers thus far? Mine's on the similar vein about how confident are you the right people are going to get them and what, que what conversations have you had with the Department of Health? We know it wasn't the Depart Department of Communities were at fault that people were only receiving shaving letters four weeks ago. So are you confident that the right people are going to get them and that GPs have actually done their job and sent out those shaving letters? Well, I mean, we, we discussed this at the Communities Committee and we were really frustrated at the fact that some very vulnerable people only got their shaving letters. We were all worried that they were invisible, by and large, but it was through the good community network and neighbours that they had. But if they live in an isolated or rural area, such as the one that Rosemary represents, then that's the fear of us all. So I will be having conversations with the Department of Health to try and ensure that something like this doesn't happen again. I call Matthew Toll. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, welcome the Minister to her job and, and, and well done for stepping up at short, at short notice. Um, she will know, because of, she did a version of the, the, the old arts decal job, that our arts sector in Northern Ireland is on its knees as a result of COVID. Venues and our cultural sector are completely critical to how we live uh, across this island. They're also critical to the economic recovery and tourism. Um, I don't know if she's had a chance to look at the letter yet and the details she will have got from the, from the cultural sector. They the the member has asked this question, and the member's way by okay. parcel deliveries will, for food. Will she look at the, I, I will at offer the, the minister she, if she will, wishes she to make a, a response. Task minister. Help the, the recovery of the arts Order. I would ask the Minister if you wish to make a response. Um, the answer is yes, even though it's got nothing to do with food, but yes, I've seen the letter, we've seen it in the committee, it was very detailed, so we're certainly looking at it, but again, it's around to the, the five-stage recovery from the executive and Harbour can move forward, but I, I fully understand the, the absolute pressure that the arts sector are under. I mean, it's people's livelihoods, people having to go to food banks, so there's a connection, they're going to food banks, so I understand it. Okay. I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I will be quick. Minister, thank you very much for your answers so far. As we know, people who needed the food parcels, some of them didn't get them. But unfortunately, there were many people who did get them that didn't need them. Uh, moving forward, are you considering some way of having an easy version of how to decide who people are? Um, I don't mean by means testing, but some, some way. And will you con continue the priority slots in supermarkets for people? Well, certainly, I'll take the last point first. The priority slots in supermarkets are very important, and I even know that some of the supermarkets in North Belfast are really keen to do this, even post-COVID, particularly for uh, people working in education, working in health, but certainly elderly people, and people, and certainly for children with autism. So they're keen to do that. I am unaware in North Belfast, it's not to say, and I hate using North Belfast, but it's just that there was a lot of need, a lot of food delivered. I'm unaware of people who got food and didn't need it. I'm not, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but I'm not aware of it. Uh, but certainly, do we need to maybe tighten things up? Absolutely. What we need to do is ensure that people who didn't get, do get. So I think that's where we're all coming from. And hopefully, whatever lessons we'll learn and experiences we'll achieve coming out of this, that that's one of the things we'll, we'll certainly look at. 
And that is the end of questions to the Minister for Communities. I ask members to take their raise for a few moments.